Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, for those of you who have not met me in the past two days in the workshop area, I'm Verena. And um, I would just like to start out with thanking Eva for inviting me to speak. I feel very honoured to be here and taking part in this um, international event. It's actually the first time I have ever been invited to speak at an international event. And um, I feel a little bit nervous just following um, the, the other speakers a bit earlier on. Um, but when I sat down and I started writing the presentation um, on the topic that you guys wanted me to speak on, um, I just decided to be unashamedly myself. And um, it is quite hard to put me in a box. So like I do represent Adobe, but um, it's not all I am. Um, I've, it's probably 27 years ago um, since I have um, attended my first earth building workshop as a um, high school student. And for me, when I entered the first earth building at age 16, it was love at first sight. Um, I knew then and there that I wanted to become an earth builder. And um, it was very hard for me at the time to convince um, my teachers and my parents that earth being an earth builder is, in effect, a thing. So I do, I do hold. Oh, yeah, that's what happens when I get closer to that thing. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, I do, in fact, hold uh, a background in um, architecture and building biology and building ecology, just for the mere fact that I had to study something proper. But. Um, it was just, a, yeah, it was a, a bit of a lost cause. I, I see myself first and foremost as an artisan. I love um, having my hands in the dirt and creating stuff. And I also lo love diversity. So 15 years ago, I had the chance of um, emigrating to New Zealand from Switzerland and um, purchasing an existing earth building business that at that point was mainly a mud brick yard. So I, I sort of inherited the Adobe part um, of, that, of that operation and then I expanded from there. And I do love Adobe a lot. Um, I, I love the simplicity of the building of that particular um, technique, um, but I, I haven't just <coughs> stuck with Adobe. And I, I'm not, I don't see myself um, as, you know, our business is not like primarily a, a mud brick yard anymore. Uh, we do all sorts of things, and we've been quite blessed with a very wide range of jobs that have various sizes, like from little pizza ovens to full homes, community projects, and so forth. So um, I, I really love that about my job, that it gives me the opportunity to have diversity, and that gives me energy too, because making bricks is a pretty hard job, especially if you don't mechanize that much. And um, I just see myself probably at the opposite other end of the scale to Martin Rauch's operation. Um, they make amazing big heavy blocks and have robots and mega clients and I have always looked up to their work like Martin Rauch is one of the big inspirations in, in, in my life for earth building but my, the course of my earth building life has taken me to very small light blocks and yeah, I, I think I sort of thought like what was the, the overall investment into like the brick side of things and it's probably around 20 to 30,000 New Zealand dollars. So we have always tried to keep it small and not, not grow our business too much and just keep it to, in a place that felt um, good for us, you know, it's so that we can do other things and just keep on being diverse. And also for me to manage that whole thing of being a mum and being um, a tradeswoman and all these things. So at the moment, um, we're actually doing a lot of earthquake repairs. Um, we have just had another big earthquake in New Zealand uh, a year ago, and we're involved in uh, repairing older earth buildings. A lot of earth buildings have, have fared very well, and then there have been problems with some um, historic buildings and some buildings that have not been constructed well. And um, before I actually start uh, talking about 
uh, the subject that you want me to talk about, I would like to mention this gentleman. And it is an amazing story that happened to me two weeks ago. And I was, you have to imagine, rural New Zealand, it's pretty much the middle, not of nowhere, but it's very rural. There's a co-op cottage. It has had a little bit of earthquake uh, damage in corners. I'm there repairing with a friend. It's a very you know, small operation, nothing. This gentleman comes and he's the immediate neighbor. And he's 82 years old and he goes, oh yeah. I used to make bricks uh, when I, I was in my 60s. Um, and do you want to come over for a cup of tea? And I was like, yep. <laughs> Like, I mean, what's the chances of that? And the story he told me just left me speechless. And it was particularly important and interesting that this has happened just two weeks before I come here to talk about Light Adobe, because he, in the mid-90s, he's, he's a geologist, so he was concerned about the environment, about insulation values and so forth back 20 years ago. And he did all this research and development into um, light adobe. And he, because he has the um, a ge a geology background, and maybe um, Pete Walker is here, and you know the whole thing about polymerized, blah blah. I'm not a chemist, but he was uh, using and trialing ionizing solution in his bricks and, and sawdust. And the brick that he showed me, he still had one left over, was amazing. It was a good quality brick. Um, he never went in, he poured about half a million dollars into that, so he was serious about it, and he had done, he had designed machines, had prototypes, he had everything, and then he had, like, there was a major flood that wiped his operation out, and at the same time there was a, an outfit in New Zealand called uh, the, uh, Excalibur Bricks, which went on the market and sold, they were very good at marketing, and they sold thousands of bricks, and most of those bricks failed. So about, I think the figure is about 85% of the homes that they constructed had problems. So those two things put this gentleman out of action. And it's a bit of a sad story, but it also shows, you know, like I think um, things come around in, in cycles and we do innovate, but like I think we don't reinvent the wheel. Like I, I really don't claim that I have invented anything about lightweight Adobe and I can share with you what a group of us have found like recently what the recipes that we have used but he has had a totally different approach and he also had a very good um, result and in fact I think he would be a very interesting person to talk to from like um, the research and the chemistry point of view. So that's just a little thing. So <laughs> I come from Switzerland, so when I studied architecture, I was looking at things like you know what Martin Rauch was doing. I was um, working for a company selling um, earth building products that you, you know like what you were showing just before, just off the shelf and it was all very exciting because it seemed that um, earth building was going to take off and, and become more mainstream, but on the other hand, I, I was really um, I really wanted to live in New Zealand, and when we had this opportunity to move and, and take on that business, that's what we did. And it, for us, it meant two things in terms of earth building. It meant sort of going back to basics a bit more. Um, and it was also going to a place that um, has quite cold buildings. So I'm not talking about earth buildings in particular, like, but some of the old building stock in New Zealand is gets really cold, especially in winter, and um, probably half of the earth buildings that I've visited are great, and then the other half, they also get quite cold. They don't get quite as cold as timber frame buildings, but they definitely are not warm in winter. For me, you know, as a European with, with th those kind of standards, and um, so I was a bit puzzled about that whole earth building mantra, and I tried already in 2002 when we bought the business um, to question that a little bit. And you know that this is nice, but like it's also like that. So these people say they have a, a comfortable house, and I, I do believe them, but I, I know that they have to heat quite a lot. So in 2007, um, there was a change in um, 
the New Zealand Building Code and energy efficiency became a little bit more part of the agenda, which I think is a great thing. Um, they, they, ra like they raised the prescribed uh, minimum R values for solid construction and that directly impacted us as brick producers. Um, up to then, we had just sort of gone along with the assumption that the R value was okay. Um, based on what the New Zealand Earth Building Standards had as a um, presumptive, you know, they had a presumptive R value as part of the standards, and we just sort of just took that as, you know, for, like, for face value, if that's the right word in English. But um, we never actually tested, and I just followed up with clients saying, I really recommend that you do a very good um, passive solar design and consider um, additionally insulating the south wall and so forth. Um, but then when, when these regulations came in, we actually decided to, to really find out the R value of the bricks and um, they, were, they, didn't, they didn't achieve minimum requirement. Um, and everyone, you know, like our Adobe blocks were sort of not fine, but sort of okay, but everyone that was compressing bricks was really not fine because their densities were higher. So we definitely had um, a problem to solve. Um, and that sort of kicked us into action to um, develop something new. And it was actually sort of like a, a thing that happened in a couple of places in New Zealand. Um, it was us, Solid Earth, together with architect Peter Lawrence, that were doing some initial tests, and Graham was also going, thinking along the same lines with another brick producer up north called um, Tim Hicks. And um, we just wanted to, as brick producers, we wanted to achieve, um, we wanted to retain all the simplicity and the straightforwardness of Adobe. We wanted it to be load-bearing in a seismic country. We wanted it to be easy to produce and install. Uh, for us, like for me personally, it was important to use local resources um, and it had to have a density of like a thousand kg or minus per cubic meters to achieve the required uh, new R values. Um, yeah, so we set out on this little mission um, of cooking class, so taking clay and mixing light aggregates in and um, seeing what happens. And um, that's, you know, we, just to explain, um, so this is the density that obviously it gets lighter as you increase the light aggregates. And this is the ratio heavy to light aggregates. Um, and then that's the strength that we tested. So we made up all these different um, bricks with different light aggregates at different ratios, uh, dried them out and got them tested for strength initially just to um, see what was promising. And in those initial tests, like, I mean, these ones are, these tests are similar to probably the, the bricks that we were sh uh, showing that you had, like those little um, lighter weight bricks. They were fine, but when they tested, they either didn't quite achieve a minimum requirement or they just achieved it. And for me, that was not enough because our he heavyweight bricks achieve about two to three times the, the requirement. So I wanted something that was comparable. Um, we then trialed other light aggregates and combinations of light aggregates. And um, through talking to the other guy that was making bricks, um, we came up with some things that seemed promising. And like the main, um, the main ingredient that made a huge difference was paper pulp. So it's just pulped recycled paper or virgin um, wood pulp if you want to use that like we used recycled paper and that it, uh, instantly made um, the strength jump quite substantially and then we thought about the the size uh, and the size distribution and the the shape of the light aggregates and we came up with um, trying shavings instead of sawdust just because they're more like plate shaped and like my 
thinking was if it's like a plate shape, it's a little bit like the clay plates and then the clay can go around it and it sort of sticks them together and that also made a, a difference. And making the paper pipe was, is quite a lot of work, so we tried in, to reduce the paper pipe to the minimum where it was still strong and we could reduce it to 10% and up the shavings quite considerably. So we ended up with a ratio of one part heavy, like clay, to four parts light aggregates, and a, a quite a good test result down here, um, nearly three times required strength. And um, yeah, so th that was that first test batch. And those te uh, bricks we made, you know, we made a mix up by hand, and then we took it to the lab, and it, they passed those tests. But um, for us, then the the next um, challenge was to scale that up and because it's very easy to make an accurate mix by hand but then to make that bigger and especially making the paper pulp um, on a bigger scale and so forth. And that's why I, where I would say, you know, like I think this process can totally be scaled up but um, we never went uh, through the length of um, actually investing in machinery that makes paper pulp. We pulp ours in, in our uh, dough mixer that also makes the plasters and there's still quite a lot of manual labor involved. You'll see it. There's a little video showing the, um, the process. But we decided it was a conscious decision. We didn't want to invest um, in going bigger um, before we were ready, really. And by the time, yeah, we just yeah, diversified into other directions. But I think it, it totally could be made um, up, scaled up in the production. And I think now, yeah, there is this movie. So. What am I doing? Here. Yeah. So that's just um, the production. These are just photos in case the um, video wouldn't play. Mm. Okay. So um, once we had, you know, a, a good like a product we were happy with, um, we got them officially thermally <coughs> tested um, by Otago University. There was a researcher there called uh, Tim Bishop, and 
he was very helpful. Um, and I mean, like, in, like my thinking was surely we can just go by density and look at the literature and the literature will tell us thermal conductivity and then we can just work out the R value. But it was quite important that New Zealand also did the tests and we just um, confirmed that clay New Zealand and light aggregates um, behave about the same as um, everywhere else on the planet. So if you look like the um, orange diamonds are our data and then the others are da uh, superimposed data from other similar research done elsewhere. And so that was good. Um, and they tested our heavy, heavyweight uh, blocks and lightweight blocks of two different densities and um, gave us the thermal conductivity. And from that, um, we could then um, figure out um, the R values for different width, uh, width of wool. So if you compare that, like there is the um, nominal values that were in, in the New Zealand Earth Building Standards um, that are all the same here, but like when we actually tested, you can see that there was a big variation and that the um, heavy materials didn't, didn't pass. Um, so those heavy materials didn't pass and uh, the lightweight materials passed very well. Um, yeah, and here, I mean, you, you see like the wider wall are achieved an R of 1.9, like some clients even want to go to the 430 wide wall, which is our bigger block in its width, and um, that feels very solid and nice, and then they uh, achieve an R value above two, and that's very pleasing. And if you wonder how to work out the R value, um, it's the thickness of the wall in meters uh, divided by the thermal conduct conductivity figure. Um, and the conductivity figure, I'll just go back, um, you just work that out by um, working out the density of your material and then going up and all over. So that will, you can just read that straight out of the graph. Um, I'm sure we will be talking about how to work that out again if you're interested, but it, it's a very simple calculation. And if you have the, like your density for your materials, you can just work that out for yourselves without further testing. These are just a few uh, photos of um, recent building sites. Um, one of the last building site in Golden Bay. So you see it's still like the totally simple construction method like with adobe blocks. Um, a little bit more complex than what we did with Peter because um, being New Zealand, we've got all the, um, the steel and um, also horizontal mesh um, every second course. But apart from that, quite similar. This is the same house nearly finished. Um, we lime plastered this and that's, that's the building two weeks ago, getting landscaped. Um, there's another building. Um, a few buildings have gone up using those, these blocks and they, the blocks, uh, the recipe or the approach has also been used by owner builders. So they just produced their own um, lightweight blocks and got them strength tested and tested for durability and then they could use their own blocks. And that's uh, doing precision cutting. Um, you see here um, the steel and, and conduit for um, electrical services. And it shows that you can cut the bricks. They're a little bit harder to cut than because of the fiber, but it's still the same masonry saw and all that. I like. Cool. So that made us quite happy for a few years. We just thought like we'll just treat them as any other brick, um, we just do follow the New Zealand Earth Building Standards and do all the testing and once that's done, we're, we're off. Um, and then we had the earthquakes in Christchurch and um, generally earth buildings fared really well. There were some problems with press brick and with buildings that had not been built to standard, but um, E-bands like the New Zealand Earth Building Association funded um, Reconnaissance trips, and um, Graham was part of that trip, um, after each major earthquake to assess damage and just learn from it and just see what needs to be done. And given the age of the New Zealand Earth Building Standards, but also the earthquake events, um, it was quite clear that we needed to work on a revision. And um, a committee was formed to do the revision of the Earth Building Standards. and. Graham is the chair of this committee and I'm sort of part of it um, from a 
materials point of view and when we were all sitting together it's a really amazing group actually because it comprises um, engineers, designers, you know, producers of earth building materials and builders and it's just amazing to see how you can look at a problem from all these different angles and if you cooperate that you can actually find really good solutions and think of things that other people wouldn't have thought of you know from their like their professional lens takes them a certain way in you know down certain path and I really I have enjoyed being part of this committee um, and one thing that became really apparent was that we would like to include light adobe and it has to be in, 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 into the new standards, into the revised standards, but it can't just be taken one for one. And when talking to engineers, there's all sorts of little differences, and it's quite a process to expand um, the standard to accommodate Light Adobe. And they also said that full scale testing of like full scale walls was on the cards, and that we needed more comprehensive laboratory testing to be able to put you know, that method into the standards. And EBANS uh, was in a position to uh, fund some of these tests. And we also had um, help, you know, support from Auckland University, like the School of Engineering. So <laughs> the engineers came up with this thing. And again, like I'm, I'm no engineer. I can't really explain in depth what they did. but. Um, they were testing um, the wall panel for out-of-plane loading, so it's loads that push the wall rather than like face on rather than sideways. So um, it will inform about earthquake loading um, and also wind. And so you know maybe you guys here in Australia are not so interested in earthquakes, but um, it's sort of transferable to wind and with climate change, wind load will go up. So I think it is really important to think about wind loud. Um, and basically what they did, they, oh, no, that was not what I wanted to do. Um, they, we, we built a, a foundation beam, but it had a hinge underneath, like here there's a hinge. And then we built the mud brick wall the way we would. Um, with, there's two reinforcing steel, steel rods going through here with a top plate. And this red frame is basically just a frame that allows the whole thing to be tilted. It's not actually holding the, um, the wall together in any way. And the green frame is where all the instruments were attached. Here you see all the instruments attached. And then they got a digger and they tilted the walls back and forth um, to simulate gravi gravitational force, like G-force. And um, here you see what happened. This was a three meter tall wall. Um, it started to, to deform and crack, um, but it didn't. It deformed substantially, like it had a lot of load on it, but it didn't fail. Um, and when we, we started the, 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 the brick, like the wall test, they said, oh, we'll build a 1.8 wall first and try and destroy it. And after when it, they couldn't destroy anything and they said oh let's go straight to a three meter wall and they were getting really excited I was like oh my god look at all the cracks but um, apparently from an engineering point of view this was very exciting and not, 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 a, not a fail at all it was and the reason why it's not a fail is because um, it actually if you look at this figure here um, that's nearly 2g that's a lot of um, loading um, and the way they achieved that was by um, tilting at 80 degrees plus putting its own weight on, on the back of the, of the wall um, statically so without too much movement and then it didn't fail and then they shook it so they actually did um, dynamic loading on it too. So here's the graph of um, the dynamic loading. You see the spikes, and it went up to 3G, which is pretty massive. <coughs> so here again, another graph showing the, uh, the static loading and then loading with the sandbags and then shaking, So and it didn't fail. So that was good. Um, and then they also took some back to the union. They did... Um, smaller t lab tests on them and they all passed and it was all fine. I'm not going to go too much into that, that well, yeah, just because of time. But yeah, so 
when I was writing this, I was like, ah, oh, it's a bit dry. <laughs> Um, but it was, it's also exciting for me because it sort of is reflecting on what we've been doing in the last, like, like these tests have been ongoing um, over the last year or so. And they, it was a, a, a series of tests. So it was shorter walls, it was a bigger wall with a lintel, it was a, a big wall. And we also tested um, another construction method, like a, a brick veneer. But um, so it was quite a lot of work and then reflecting on it, it actually all pulled it together quite nicely and I'm glad I could um, present it in this form. And then, like just reflecting on, on it all, um, the conclusions, um, not just of these tests, but like just looking back on the whole development, um, is that light adobe is suitable for load bearing construction in seismic zones, um, provided it's designed properly. So like, um, I mean, in, in New Zealand, we've got that, these are earth building standards that prescribe the amount of reinforcing vertically and horizontally. Um, the tests uh, did come up with um, the result that um, the minimum modulus of rupture, so that, that, that um, flexural tensile strength minimum requirement, um, has to be upped a little bit, which is not really affecting us because we're achieving three times strength, but they just need to adjust it a little bit. Um, we believe that the production of light adobe blocks are, is easily scaled up. So I'm totally aware that this is sort of bordering on owner builder type scale, but it really depends what you want to achieve. I mean, if you want to go into production of these blocks, you could scale it up easily and make, make the bricks however you want to make them on a more, in a more um, efficient way or bigger output. And if you're an owner builder, you can have a hand mold and produce them. And you know, it's, it's really the amount of investment that you want to, that makes sense to be poured in. And that's one thing that I love about Adobe is that you have that choice. You can make it with a hand mold or you can make it with a machine, like a big pro uh, production line machine. Um, and it's, it's really, you know, what you want to achieve with it. Um, they're easier, like, they're easier to use mostly, like they're lighter, so they're not as back-breaking. Um, we really like them and we like, like, for the heavy bricks, we usually have square bricks and that's just sort of like enough weight, but for the lightweight ones, we got to one and a half size, so you're a bit faster with the laying. Um, they're a little bit harder to cut, however, because of the fiber content. Um, and they, they, they do well, they have done well in the spray erosion test. Now we found out that that is not actually that relevant, but um, we have had quite a good uh, weathering test on site um, on our last build, that yellow house you saw. Um, we built that last, when was it? November, December, and um, we had, I think, 400 mil of rain in the month we were trying to build the house. Um, and we did cover the tops of the walls, but it was not just rain, it was gale force winds and it was hard to cover. And um, the walls um, didn't erode, they stood up to that sort of natural spray erosion test quite well. Um, however, the very exposed, like we had a wall that was just sort of freestanding without a return, without a bracing, that got quite wet. And when that dried out, it warped a little bit. So that. I found that quite interesting in learning. And I think that the whole thing, I mean, we can't blame anyone, but the learning from that would be that I, um, either we would brace during construction or we would ask the design to brace so that you don't just have long freestanding ends of walls. Um, and um, we f feel that they should get, be plastered, so finished off with, with a plaster on the outside and inside. Um, it's not because of the, it, m much because of erodibility at all. It's uh, it's more because it's quite porous and a little bit messy. And um, we found that lime plasters adhere really well because of the the fibers, and um, that worked really well. And on the inside, we just rubbed them down with an earthy clay mix and that tidies the surface up really nice. It's not that much work. Um, yeah, so I really need to acknowledge quite a lot of people um, that were involved in all, all of this. 
they're the engineers that have been involved um, and the engineering students and also from our side we have had quite a lot of volunteer ha help, um, interns and, and woofers and workers and whatnot. Um, there was Alan Dryton and Tim Hicks from other natural um, earth building companies in New Zealand and um, Peter Lawrence and Graham North that had you know, they were sort of a bit of a driving force behind it. And um, yeah, just the funding came from EBAN's Auckland University and Otago University. And that, this is the end of the presentation. Wait a sec. <laughs> um, even though I haven't heard anything, so I think I'll just make up a bit of time. But um, I have come to this international conference without business cards. So, someone said that, like the guy from Rock Hot said, that was a bit embarrassing. Um, so, this is the business card. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>